Welcome everyone to Hill TV's first ever live coverage. This one of the fourth Democratic presidential debate. We're going to be coming to you live throughout the night with an amazing group of guests who break everything down. Sagar, what do we have first? Well, we've got Bernie Sanders senior advisor Chuck Rocha. He's going to be joining us before the debate gets underway. Then we're going to be back during the debate's commercial break for some very quick analysis. And after that, we're going to be joined by an incredible panel of guests, including Democratic strategist Don Calloway and Andrew Feldman. And from the Independent Women's Forum, our friend Inez Stepman, as well as Intercept reporter Ryan Grimm. You are not going to want to miss this. First up, though, we are joined by our colleague and friend here at Hill TV and host of the Why You Should Care and What America's Thinking shows, Jamal Simmons. So good to have you with us tonight, sir. It's good sir. to be here with you guys. Um, yeah. Let me be the first to say I think it's going to be an amazing show. Right oh, now, it's going to be an amazing. It's going to be an incredible Fair show for Fair everybody. Fair to say. Um, so let's start with talking about, we wanted to go through each of the candidates and kind of what they need to do tonight, what the expectations are for them. So let's start with the top three, the front runners. You've got Warren first in first time on the stage in the real front runner status. You've got obviously Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Jamal, what do you think Warren needs to do out there tonight? Well, she's going to be playing a lot of defense. I mean, this is one of these nights where people are probably going to be coming for Senator Warren. She's the leader of the pack here in terms of what's happening on that stage. So she's going to be playing some defense. I think she's also got some new plans she's rolled out today. She's talking about how to keep bigger money, more big money out of the presidential campaign, including keeping donors from becoming ambassadors, which is a pretty ambitious yeah. thing to say. Yeah, it's a big I deal. thought that was a big deal. An interesting contrast with, I mean, she said she was going to extend her grassroots fundraising into the general election, but then and left this wide open loophole vis-a-vis -vis the DNC that she would right. still do high dollar fundraisers for them, which is, you know, I mean, basically if you're the nominee, right. the party's fundraising and your fundraising mm. are essentially the same things. I wonder if that's something that she gets pushed on tonight. She probably does get pushed on it. You know, someone like Pete Buttigieg, who has said that he would probably also keep that door open because you got to have the resources to compete, oh, yeah, which you called, don't want to do is pull that down. donors pocket change. Right. And then playing. Not with, a great one. He compared it to like playing <laughs> with your hands tied behind your back. I mean, I think this really does underscore, right, Jamal, that where her vulnerability is, is that she's able to be hit from the left, particularly if a Bernie Sanders. I mean, you saw in that interview, in the ABC News interview, when he said, well, I think Elizabeth is a cat capitalist through her bones, yeah. and I am not. So he can talk about purity tests from in terms of fundraising. He already swore off no DNC, big dollars. I think that that corruption plan, or what the ambassador plan she announced today, was a way to head that off, give her a little bit more rhetor rhetorical firepower before going in. Yeah, I think also, yeah. though, there are a lot of voters in the Democratic primary who are capitalists also. Oh, right? sure. I mean, yeah, so, sure. So what you see is, yeah. uh, particularly the voters who are with somebody like Joe Biden right now, mm -hmm. and if, though, if Joe Biden continues to slide, a lot of his voters are going to be looking from somewhere to go. Elizabeth Warren has an interest in being someone who is aligned with the left of the party, who is a voice for people on the left of the party, but is accessible to other people. She's right. trying to win, not just make a point. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. What do you think Biden needs to do tonight? I mean, there, that interview with Hunter this morning, in my yeah. view, was a total disaster. He was all over the map. He said he only got there because of the <laughs> Biden name. He said it was right. a swamp. I mean, these all could go directly into Trump campaign ads, essentially. Um, do you think the moderators are going to press him on this stuff? And do you think any of the other candidates on the so stage are going to press him? So I predicted this. I don't think that the moderators are going to press him in the way that he actually needs to be pressed. They're going to say, oh, you've been, your son's past has been weaponized against you. How do you respond? He's going to pivot to some version of how, you know, President Trump needs to be impeached. Now, the real question, I think, for Biden is how he's going to be able to play defense if any of the candidates will even touch it. And generally, they don't need to touch Hunter Biden specifically. Everybody knows it was terrible. That's all what's happening. But it's like, if he hung his hat on the electability, on, on electability, and that is slowly just being knocked away from against him now that he's number two in almost all of the national polling averages. So it really is, I think, his debate to lose with Elizabeth Warren standing up there up at the top. Yeah, yeah. I don't spend a lot of time defending yeah. the Biden campaign, but it's very interesting to think about what they had to do. At some point, they were going to have to roll Hunter Biden out. Right. And I think they probably decided today there's a lot of other news that is happening out there. Push Hunter Biden out. Frankly, I think he it wasn't great, but considering <laughs> Considering the health challenges, <laughs> the, considering the health challenges that he's had, he's been, you know, he's talked about openly. They've been on drugs. Oh, yeah. uh, he's he held up in the course of in the course of a long mm -hmm. interview. They had to do something to get that out there sooner rather than later. I don't know why you do that <laughs> on the day. That, and as you know, if, if he was, if you were counseling that campaign and you were giving Hunter advice on what to say, I mean, it was. Not great messaging, right. let's just say. <laughs> um, the other, you know, of the trio who is going to be at the center of the stage there is Bernie Sanders. And, of course, this will be his first big event 
post heart attack. You know, pundits have really sort of downplayed their expectations. Some have even called for him to drop out, which of course is absurd given that he raised more money right. than any of the other candidates, has more donors, um, fastest campaign to a million donors in presidential history, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, he's got to come out swinging tonight. He does have to prove that he's strong, that he's in it to win it. And I think he will, honestly. The interviews that he's given um, since his health scare, he's been very strong. He's for the first time started to draw that distinction with Elizabeth Warren, which, look, frankly, I know it's not comfortable for him, but if he wants to win, he has to do. You have to give people a reason to choose you over Warren. There are differences here, right? She mm -hmm. is more of an institutionalist. He is more of a revolutionary. Now, that may not be everybody's cup of tea, but there are 70 percent of Americans out there who say they are furious at the political establishment. Right. So there are plenty of voters in that lane for him to get if he makes that clear case. The challenge for him is he is sliding. And poll after poll, he keeps sort of sliding. He used to be, I mean, last time he got 40 percent or so more of the Democratic right. vote. He's now in some polls down in the low teens. He's got to figure out how does he turn that around and go ahead. Frankly, having a health scare uh, mm. is not the greatest thing in trying to turn that ship around. I think the real thing is, you're, you're, I think you're right to point out that he's sliding, but I, it really is that he's just not capturing those voters that are slipping away from Kamala Harris, from Beto O'Rourke, from Pete Buttigieg. Well, look, he he's, needs he's to capture to get the white affluent liberal vote. Absolutely. I mean, his but message is class warfare. So the, the like wealthy white people right. aren't going to Sanders. And that's who was with yeah. Buttigieg and Kamala by and large. But they have fallen already as much as they are essentially going to fall. The big question is, if Biden really starts to slide, his coalition looks a lot more like Sanders' coalition. He has a lot of working class support and a lot of diverse support, just like Bernie Sanders. So what you have to do is be able to make the case that you are the person who is electable, that you are the person who those voters should be looking at if they move away from Biden. Right. Yes, that case. You know, it's interesting. Elizabeth Warren is running. She has almost the exact same coalition that Barack Obama had at this point in mm. the 2007 campaign when he was running against Hillary That's Clinton. Right. If she can figure out how to crack the code with some union voters and some African American voters, she right. stands a very good chance to take yeah. it. Yeah. So, so let's talk about some of the centrists. Yeah. I mean, we had Pete Buttigieg really previewing an attack on mm -hmm. Warren. Warren and Sanders. I mean, his new ad goes after them by name. He's also weirdly been punching at Beto O'Rourke. Not mm -hmm. sure why. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he had this strange comment where he said, you know, we can't beat Trump with pocket change, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, offending grassroots donors. I'm not sure I would advise a candidate to do that. But um, Jamal, it looks like he is coming into this and Sagar mm -hmm. uh, in a much sort of feistier way than we've seen in the past. Yeah. He is. He's got to show that, right? It, and I think that's really what it, what it is all about for Pete is he needs to, uh, is what we were talking about earlier, if Beto and Kamala and all these other affluent white liberals are fleeing away and going to Elizabeth Warren, he's got to go after Elizabeth Warren because that's actually who he's fighting for. It's that affluent yeah. vote. He needs to pose himself as a number two or a number three dark horse candidate. Let's not forget, he's all in on Iowa, right? He's actually right. polling quite well there, almost 14%. And if he thinks he can get to a number two or number three slot, slingshot him into another very white and with an affluent base in New Hampshire, that that could set a narrative going in. I'm not I, saying I buy no, it, I know, I but know. that I is know. a That's strategy. The that the, is a here's strategy. This, here's from all the what yeah. I don't get. Like, at it, the attacks on Bernie and Warren over Medicare for All have been relentless. Sure. Like, the Republicans have been attacking them. Biden's been attacking them. I mean, Amy Klobuchar has been attacking them, and none of it has worked, right? Mm -hmm. Kamala has fallen from basically stepping away from Medicare for All and looking like she flip-flopped on the issue. Why does he think this line of attack, and why does Amy Klobuchar, why do any of them think this line of attack is eventually going to land? Because anybody talking to donors every day is hearing this in their ear right. all the time. Oh, right. God, that's I a mean, great point. <laughs> <laughs> all the donors in New York and, yeah. and uh, California are talking about this all of the time. And guess who Pete is talking yeah. to a lot Stop of. Stop talking to donors. <laughs> yeah, that's the real there's, question. A, there's some advice and, right know, there. And, and so the question, the question is going to be, how does he hold up for that? Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. What about Kamala Harris, Jamal? Yeah. You know, Kamala Harris, I, I did a thing about this for the remedy the other show that I do here on the mm -hmm. YouTube network. And um, the thing that we talked about today is she's got to, I think, get out of her head and get more into her heart. Right. She actually is, she's got a great story. She's a really strong and powerful politician. She's navigated a lot of treacherous politics in California to get to be attorney general, to get to be a senator, to get to be a candidate for president of the United States. She needs to talk a little bit about that struggle and mm -hmm. that journey and bring people into it. Tell, tell stories about the people she's meeting and not just sort of paint these big scenarios. I think if she can get out of her own head and let people into who she is as a person, she might be able to turn it around. She may not win, 
but she might finish with a more strong and competitive face what than is what her, she has I now. mean, what is her vision for the country? Right, exactly. Like, how would you question. describe yeah. it? Not that's, Trump. That's it. That's, that's yeah. all I really know. I mean, know. it's the resume. Yeah. It's, right. you know, I'm young. I'm new. I have this background. But I couldn't really say how she's any different from Klobuchar, Booker, like Buttigieg, Beto, yeah, et cetera, it et cetera. It but it's Joe Biden, Biden Jr. But Biden right? was yeah. Obama's vice president. Right. You're, you know, like this new California senator. It's like, why are you running for president? All these poll tested things. It just really does not. It does not speak well to. Well, uh, I mean, let's let's also yeah. be real. I mean, she's a, she's a woman of color. She's uh -huh. a United States senator. In some ways, she kind of is the Obama that one would assume in this race. Right. If we just looked at it from a demographic <laughs> perspective, sure, sure. she's yeah. a little more modern and sensible mm -hmm. in that sense. And I think um, what she hasn't been able to do is really animate the coalition that Obama was able to mm -hmm. animate, starting with, you know, upper middle class liberals yep. and then going to working class African Americans. Yeah, yeah. well, so. Cory Booker is kind of in that same struggle, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a guy who... Every single debate, the pundits say he did a great job, right? He almost always comes down at the top in terms of speaking time. Yeah. Very good at, you know, <laughs> getting in there and saying a lot of words. But he's another one where the vision hasn't really been there, or at least, you know, he, he started with this idea of radical love. People didn't really respond to it. <laughs> right. I was going to say, I thought that radical love was the vision. It's, it's just nice. I mean, mean, like, what is it People didn't mean? love love. Yeah. And then <laughs> the other issue for him is, is he's another emblem of, business as usual. I mean, very cozy with the donor right. class, right? Very comfortable in that world. And it just hasn't resonated with people who are looking for that sort of authentic mm. voice and that big picture vision for the future. He read too many profiles back in like 2014 comparing him to Barack Obama. <laughs> is that the, what yeah, that's really what it is. I mean, I think that's what it was all about is like ultimately he just read too many of these profiles. It got into his head. There's no real reason to vote for Cory Booker for president. There just isn't. I mean, there is not for if you're a reasonable person who wants to defeat Trump or to change the country. Every other one of these candidates has an actual vision, and I just don't see it for him. Look, he could bring yeah. home that crucial swing state of New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Good. I will, I will yeah. say this in Corey's yeah. defense, though. Yeah. Cory Booker is running his campaign today the same way he ran for mayor of That's Newark right. a dozen right. years ago. Yeah. He has not really changed as a candidate and as a perspective. And mm -hmm. so I think That's for true. him... I watched that documentary. No, absolutely. He was I very think feisty then. He, he was feisty. <laughs> He's feisty when you see him out. Yeah. But I think with, with this idea of, like, we can be better than who we are, we're going to bring people mm -hmm. together. We're going to unite the clans and have a much bigger and better campaign. Right. Yeah. He's been talking about that from the beginning of his campaign. He's been quoting Gandhi and King and all these big, you know, figures. The thing is, in this moment in time, people are angry. Just They're not, not looking want. for a peacetime yeah. conciliary. They want a wartime fighter. Yeah, exactly. And he hasn't proven and himself. If you right look, and bottom line is, if you want to go back to the way things are were, which I think is a complete fantasy, but mm -hmm. if you're indulging in that fantasy that Trump is an aberration, we're going to go back to the politics of the past, Joe Biden is obviously your guy. Yeah. Right. That's, so that's, yeah, that exactly. lane is already well covered. Amy Klobuchar, same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, she's basically making the exact same case that Biden's making. I'm the electable candidate, right? I can win in this swing state. I do so well in the state of Minnesota. I'm a centrist. I'm not going to sound crazy and talk about socialism like these other people. I mean, she really went hard against the progressive wing of the party in her appearance on Bill Maher over the weekend, um, which sort of, you know, belies her previous rhetoric about we're all more the same than we are different. Right. But here we are. She's struggling to gain re relevance. She's struggling even to make it to the next debate stage. This is kind of a make or break moment for Amy Look, Klobuchar. some of these people have to also be worried about what happens to them in their home states. Yeah, they should right? be. Because right. if you don't finish you strong, so? if yeah. you're running for president and you're at the 2 3% mark and I'm a, an upcoming politician mm -hmm. in Minnesota or in California, I might be thinking, and maybe that person's a little right. softer, weaker than I thought they were. Yeah. I should be looking at No, and that's yeah. true. I mean, you look at somebody like Amy Klobuchar, all that negative press about her, her staff, how she treated her staff, the comb and the salad, which is weird. <laughs> the fact that she's not a potato. <laughs> will never. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget it either. I'm like, every time I look at her, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, that's the thing is about Amy is you don't know why she would be running for the president. And actually, she's probably not, she's not distinguishing herself and back in her home state. So maybe a lot of this anti-progressive messaging is actually to shore up some of that centrist vote that she has back in Minnesota. I mean, That's the only plausible explanation. I think it's authentically held. It's yeah. just not what anybody wants. Right. Yeah. That's well, the bottom. Not I'm anyone who's yeah. not voting not, for Joe Biden already. Not in the presidential that. contest, yeah. but in some of these states, there are populations of voters sure. who do want
want somebody right. who can espouse those messages. Yeah. But right. she might be the one to do it. Yeah. Tom Steyer on the stage for the first time, oh, Jamal. He is. Well, look, he's at 1.4% or something like that in the last <laughs> he poll. He fought his way on. I mean, that's what really <laughs> happened yeah. here. You know, but he does have a couple of issues that I think need to be talked about. I love about. the photo look, we have. Jay Inslee. That is, <laughs> <laughs> is he the guy from the Monopoly again? Yeah, no, might as well. um, it's wrong, guys. <laughs> you know, Jay Inslee's not in this campaign anymore, but Tom Steyer is the other person here who really has climate change, the center of who he is as a politician mm -hmm. in his public life. So I think, you know, he, he probably will talk about climate change. He also is the impeachment guy. And I wonder if his whole point of running for president is to be the guy on the stage who really does take out the Trump. But they, all, yeah, they already all support, support impeachment. impeachment. Well, now so that's true. That really wasn't true when he got in the race. I, know, man. I guess it's like a weird commercial for impeachment. I, I, I don't know. I, what else is his candidacy? Like... I, I, yeah, I, don't exactly. know. I can't explain why. I, can, I really can't explain why he got in. I think it's a tough thing in this moment in the country to mm. be, you know, in the Democratic Party to be a billionaire yeah. hedge fund guy running for this office who basically bought your way on the stage. I think he's going to have to answer some questions about right. that, and you know. He's got to he's got to make an impression. Yeah. You've got um, Julian Castro. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of pundits were very mad at him because he attacked <laughs> Joe Biden last debate. Um, he's not afraid to fight, though. He is not afraid to fight. And if I think he had a little bit more of an electric personality, he would be a top ten top tier candidate in this race. But you know, he probably he hasn't raised the money that he's needed. You know, the, uh, New York Times had a thing this week with all the candidates and the number of field offices they had in around a bunch of states. He didn't even have any. Wow. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah you know, he's hanging on with Buddha his Buttigieg and Warren are ahead of that 47 apiece. Biden and Bernie right. are tied at 34. He doesn't have any. Yeah, this is um, you can't run a campaign a without any field. Another one who's yeah. kind of hanging on by their right. fingernails is Beto, who was oh, another one who was compared to Obama. Yeah. Right. You remember the Vanity Fair profile, interview with yeah. Oprah in Times Square, all of this. And then, you know, yeah. he just, he wasn't up to the moment. Well, he didn't have that vision that we're talking about. And there really wasn't a lot for people to grab onto here when he wasn't up against Ted Cruz. Being not Ted Cruz is not good enough to be president enough. of the United States. It was good enough for the national media and Vanity Fair and Vogue and all these other people whenever it was was Texas and he didn't have a chance in hell. But it was the same thing now that he's on the national stage. If you want to talk about somebody who blew it from the very beginning, oh, Beto yeah. O'Rourke, with he's his ridiculous a, yeah. road trip, you know, the Vanity Fair announcement. The dentist I mean, visit. Who? Yeah, the dentist. I mean, it's just over and over down. again. He's got he's to probably spend a lot of time wondering, what if I had just gotten in the presidential race Which right after this? all you should have done. When everybody yeah. was hungering for right. him to get in, he at least would have had the updraft of yes. having, you know, you gotten know in when everybody was hungering for him versus when people were sort of saying, what's up with Better or worse. Now that Mayor Pete is going after him, I kind of like him a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, oh God, yeah. uh, next up we've got Andrew Yang, yes. who last debate, he announced that he was going to be giving out his freedom dividend. Right. Pete laughed at him. The pundit said this was ridiculous. And then he continued to climb in the polls, raised $10 million. And, you know, you talk about some of these more established candidates, senators, governors, members of Congress, et cetera, who aren't even making the next stage or didn't even make this stage. Andrew Yang is here. He's here to stay. He just needs to be himself tonight. I mean, one of the things that always sets him apart, first of all, he's just got a different approach to this whole thing. He he's kind of got this meta thing going on where he's observing the yeah, ridiculousness right. and absurdity. Yeah. <laughs> of yeah. the performative nature of what they're doing. And he's got a sense of humor. So I think as long as he just does his thing tonight, he doesn't need to get down in the mm. mud. He just needs to talk about his core issues. He's going to continue to gain slowly but steadily. See, I talked about this on the show, and I think that I, I take a little bit of a different approach. I think he needs to actually start swinging. I think he needs to take a few shots at some of the other candidates. Because when you have a bold— you imagine that? It is, but that's— a, <laughs> Look, you're running for president. Ten, yeah. A lot of people gave you $10 million. If you truly believe that you're the only person that sees it, you got to make your case. The one to two minute measly, you know, opening and close statements, that's not enough. You got to get in there, get into some of these fights, shout your way in. You don't have to make a, a fool out of yourself. Yeah. But you can you can case. be a forceful person. And if you really want to be in the Oval Office, I think well, that's what you got to show. You know, I've been, at, I've been yeah. at the last couple of debates yeah. for the for the Hill TV. Yeah. And I got the Hill TV. The Hill yeah. TV. It's like the Facebook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, the thing about Yang that's also yeah. impressive is he's the most accessible candidate of the people yeah, who Yeah, you run. can ask me. He Absolutely. stays, yeah. but he stays. Stays right. in the spin room until literally the last person leaves. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden never even shows never up in the spin, in like spin room. Yeah, yeah, Andrew Yang is there all the way to the end. If he's doing that in the road, I see why people like him. Speaking of not afraid to throw a punch, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard. Oh, yeah. Back on the stage tonight. <laughs> um, she previewed a potential attack on Warren's fitness to be commander in chief with us. She, of course, memorably took Kamala Harris down. She has never recovered. I would say it's the most impactful moment of any of the debates so far. And 
And look, Syria front and center in the right. news. This is a woman who, whatever you think of her, has incredible credibility in the area of foreign policy, America's endless wars and military engagements overseas. So she could have a big night. She's always the most, when she's on the stage, she's always the most Googled person. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. It's because she is, just like Andrew Yang, she's got a unique vision for the country. Right. Putting it all in on we need to get out of these endless wars. You know what she's wars, about. That is exactly, and you know what? There's a lot of people across, I remember when she was going after, what, was it Tim Ryan in that first debate? Yeah. And the whole pundit class was like, oh, Tim Ryan cleans uh, Tulsi Gabbard's clock on Afghanistan. No. The American people are with Tulsi Gabbard on Afghanistan. Nobody wants to be in Afghanistan. A lot of people don't want to be in Syria right well, now. Well, he, he thought that the yeah, Taliban yeah. had brought down our towers. Right, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Well, the challenge is, though, <laughs> yeah. if, if part of your being consistent yeah. in, in, in being strong is being cozied up to uh, Bashir Assad. Right. I don't think, I don't <laughs> that's, think that's fair I mean, to that's say. Not, yeah. That's not met, the kind of thing that most people in the country would particularly like. Yes. And that's coming after Elizabeth Warren is somebody who has yeah. been pretty consistent in her public right. policy positions for a very long time. I think she's going to have a yeah. tough I, time on we'll that stage and going forward in the campaign. All I want to say is if we had followed Tulsi Gabbard's foreign policy and stayed out of Iraq yeah. and stayed out of Syria and Absolutely. broke it, we would be in a much better place <laughs> than we are now. All right. Um, later on, Senator Bernie Sanders senior advisor Chuck Rocha is in and talk about Sanders' performance. But first, Bernie and another candidate, Andrew Yang, they've got some similarities, but a primary difference in their platforms. It's Sanders would like to see a federal jobs guarantee while Andrew Yang proposes a universal basic income. Here's how candidate Sanders contrasts UBI and a federal jobs guarantee. Bottom line for me uh, is that technology and robotics and artificial intelligence are not unto themselves bad things if they work to benefit ordinary people. If all that they do is make the rich richer and CEOs even wealthier, if they cost us jobs and drive up corporate profits, that is not acceptable. So the challenge that we face is how do we use technology to improve the lives of working people? So if you have a really a terrible job, uh, a boring job, uh, and we make your job better and we enable you to work 20 hours a week rather than 40 hours a week, is that a bad thing? It is not a bad thing. But it means to say you still need to earn income to live by. We can't cut your salaries in half. Right. Now, one of the areas that we are working with, we take a very, uh, you know, a different approach to Mr. Yang, and that is, uh, I believe, in a uh, jobs guarantee. There are an enormous amount of work, uh, there is an enormous amount of work that has to be done all the way from child care uh, to health care to education to rebuilding our infrastructure to combating climate change to dealing with our growing elderly population. Enormous number of jobs out there. And I believe under a Sanders administration what we would do is create those jobs and as people lose their jobs there will be other jobs available. But bottom line it's we cannot allow robotics, technology, artificial intelligence to simply throw people out on the street. Technology has got to benefit all of us, not just the heads of large corporations. Why is a federal jobs guarantee better than a universal basic income? I will tell you why. Uh, a simple reason. I think most people want to work. They want to be a productive member of society. I think it's a very deeply ingrained uh, feeling that people have. They don't want to sit on the side. Yes, of course, getting a guaranteed income is better than having nothing and sleeping out on the street. That's for sure. But I think people want to be part of, you know, part of our humanity to be truthful and how we feel good about ourselves is when we are productive members of our society. We're contributing something. Uh, and I think people feel that very strongly. And I think there is more than enough work to be done in so many areas. And our job is to say, if you are able to work, we have a job for you. Because the truth is, we have so much work to do to rebuild this country in so many ways. Joining Team Rising on debate night is friend of the show, Ryan Grimm. Ryan is the Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief of The Intercept, the big man on Yay. campus. Welcome, Ryan. It's great to see you. Good to be here. So glad you're here. Yeah. So All right. what yeah. are you looking at tonight? We've been talking a lot about whether Sanders is actually going to go after Warren, whether he should, what might land. You have thoughts. Well, we're going to see. I think if Sanders goes after Warren the way that he did in the interview recently, 
think there's an argument to be made that it actually helps her. Mm -hmm. Jamal was making a, was alluding to that point earlier in the sense that she's trying to win the nomination. One of the concerns that a lot of people have about her is that is that she's too far to the left. Not necessarily people watching this. Mm -hmm. Right. But, <laughs> I hear it all the time. Yeah. yeah. The, the circles election. I'm in, yeah. I hear it all the so, time. Yeah. And re Republicans are salivating at the idea of being able to paint her as a socialist. Uh -huh. They've been very public but about they, they being able to They do that. They're going to paint Joe Biden as a socialist. But every, <laughs> but every time Bernie Sanders says publicly that she's a capitalist, mm -hmm. I'm a socialist, she's the capitalist, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that registers with a lot of Democratic voters who... Now, the ones who want a socialist from that are they're going to go they're going to go for Bernie Sanders. Yeah. But if they but if he pushes her that way and then at the same time if you have people on the on the right coming at her from the other direction, then more progressive Democrats are like, "Oh, maybe she is one of us. Right. She's getting attacked I, by Joe Biden." That's I hear, interesting I point. hear that's you interesting on point. that. I hear you on that. I think it's possible. But what I would say is I think that's sort of signaling for she's more of an institutionalist and I'm more of an more anti-establishment. Right. And maybe that's the way he needs to phrase it. But it's kind of like, you know, Trump was willing to say things that no political consultant right. would advise you to say. And what people took from that wasn't like those specific things. It was, this guy's not poll tested. He's actually saying mm -hmm. what he believes. There was a lot of power in that. Right. And so I've always thought that by Sanders embracing that label, which is supposed to be so toxic, and especially so toxic in the heartland and in these industrial Midwestern states, where he performs the best and with the working class voters that he performs the yeah. best with, it's because he's willing to say the thing that he's not supposed to say. Don't we have to don't we have to think about the fact that a lot of people who are running in Democratic primary, who are gonna vote in Democratic primary, are Democrats, right? Like so they're institutionalists. Right. So there's a portion of voters I think Sanders is rightfully going after who are new people who are not part of the party process and he's trying to suck them into the Democratic Party to help overtake them. But there's already a big bank of voters who are Democrats mm -hmm. and who believe in the party. Right. And, and w one problem he has is that he, you know his his strategy is unpolable. Mm -hmm. right. so, <laughs> as right. by definition, he's trying to get people who don't normally vote. He's pollsters don't poll mm -hmm. people that don't normally vote. Tonight there's a baseball game. That's a problem for him. And in general, people who don't normally yeah. vote right. don't watch these kinds of debates. Good so point. this debate, he's really competing for people who are planning to vote in the yeah. primary. Because why the, else are they watching? Yeah. The other thing that we need to talk about here, Ryan, is about the 15% threshold. We were talking a little bit about this during the break. Just explain it a little bit for the viewers. And why does it actually matter in the context yeah, of such a field like this? So in right? Iowa, at every individual yeah. caucus, if somebody is below 15%, then all of their supporters who came to caucus now have a choice. You can either go home uh -huh. or you can vote for somebody else. Now, in 2004, uh, Dennis Kucinich and John Edwards actually struck this deal. Oh, where really? They said, yeah, yeah, they said, <laughs> if, if you're on, and, and the deals like this happen in Iowa. Yeah. yeah. And I think candidates should think about it, like a, a Yang and a Sanders or something like yes. that, where it's remainder. So if you have 19 uh, de caucus caucusers mm -hmm. you, you actually only get credit for 15 of those it goes by fives so these four remainders would then go over to the yang camp now if yang's under 15 all of his go go over there but the point for somebody like yang at this point and and everybody if you're under 15 percent coming out of iowa you're actually at zero wow and if you're if you're at zero that's why they call it winnowing you get mm -hmm. winnowed out that's yeah. a good point Excellent point. Um, so maybe my friend Sagar is right. I'm always yeah. willing to listen. That that's he right. To, you got to fight. He needs to I mean, go for it tonight. That's, that's, yeah. what, that's the way I look at it. I mean, and, and I think that the main the main thing for a lot of these candidates is they got to just come out and and tell the American people why you actually want to be president. There, instead of this unity, this unity love fest. The summer's over. Look, like summer to be love is to be over. Uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You're gonna like let the working class drown because you're afraid of hurting Elizabeth exactly. Warren's feelings. Exactly. Like that's not it's yeah. not a, an okay excuse. All right. All right. We are very excited to see where this goes tonight. We actually have a team on the ground there in Ohio, the Hills reporter Julia Manchester, and the rest of our team standing by in the spin room. Here's Julia. This is the spin room where a number of candidates will walk through those curtain doors over there and make their way over to the CNN set where they will give a live reaction to tonight's debate. Then they'll come over and meet with other members of the media on this side of the room. We'll be here to get live reaction from the candidates throughout the night. Thank you for watching our pre-debate coverage. We'll be back with a quick 10-minute cut-in during the debate's commercial break. Then we're going to be back after the debate for a full hour of our analysis with the star-studded panel. Indeed. You do not you know how we want do it. to miss this. <laughs> Everybody tune in. Make sure you're subscribed. It's been an amazing preview, and let's get started.